Hi, this is Ellie Fishman, and welcome to our latest series of vodcasts. And this is going to be on the evaluation of the suspected renal mass. And we're going to look at some of the key points in allowing you to make the diagnosis of whether we're looking at a cyst or a high density cyst or a tumor, be it papillary or clear cell, whether we're looking at a mass and it's actually lymphoma or maybe an oncocytoma. We're going to look at some of the key factors that allow us to make the diagnosis. Now, at the end of the day, renal cell accounts for about 85% of all renal cancers. There's over 210,000 cases uh, each year in the United States, with about 80% of them being clear cell, about 15% papillary, and chromophobes account for most of the rest. Clear cell is the most common to metastasize. Clear cell is typically vascular, so both the primary and the metastasis are typically going to be vascular. As we mentioned, oncocytomas are something we're getting a little more experience with, and they measure about 4% of the tumors. Now, when you look at renal cell, there's certain risk factors. Male versus female, 1.6 to 1. Smoking, obesity, high blood pressure, long-term dialysis. You do see renal cell in some inherited conditions, think von Hippel-Lindau. But again, when you see renal cell in von Hippel-Lindau, it's often multiple, often bilateral, but often in patients in their 20s and 30s, where renal cell typically is somewhat in their 60s. And there's certain carcinogens and medications that tend to have increased risk factors. If you look at some of the numbers, the typical SEER data, renal cell cancer and tumors of the renal pelvis make up about 73,000 cases a year about 4.2% of all new cancers in the U.S., and number eight on the list. Like many cancers, the uh, average age, 64, not a great surprise. One of the good things because of imaging is that the majority of renal cell cancers are picked up incidentally these days, and when you pick up tumors as incidental findings, they're often localized to the primary site, and that's about two-thirds of the cases. Renal cell carcinoma spread, whether it's the lymph nodes, liver, lung, or bone, is going to be less common. Now, we talk about classic presentations, and we speak about hematuria. When you have hematuria, particularly macroscopic hematuria, you really worry about a tuber. You worry about it more in older patients, but even in younger patients. Once you have macroscopic hematuria, you worry. Microscopic hematuria, even in older patients, it's only a couple percent chance that you actually have a tumor present. Renal cell carcinoma can present with flank pain, a palpable mass, weight loss, fever, hypercalcemia. Obviously, the ones at the bottom of the chart are when things are picked up late, and it's often the metastasis that are giving the symptoms. As I mentioned, we talk about microscopic and microscopic hematuria. That's very important when we do protocols, particularly in younger patients. When it's macroscopic because of the high frequency of tumor, we're going to do uh, all four phases. We'll skip a phase if we're thinking about microscopic hematuria. We may target the images and areas scanned a little bit more. So that macroscopic versus microscopic is very, very important. In patients less than 35 years of age, uh, we only acquire non-contrast arterial and delayed phase imaging, and we do it over the kidneys and only on delayed get a look at the bladder. In older patients, of course, we'll always scan the bladder on arterial phase imaging because often the small bladder cancers are going to be very vascular and easiest to see uh, when they're enhancing opposite the urine, which is water density. So that becomes very important. The treatment for renal cell is surgery, but things have changed over time from classic nephrectomies to partial nephrectomies with nephron-sparing surgery. We also talk about select cases of percutaneous ablation, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and vaccine therapy for patients with more advanced disease. We used to talk about partial nephrectomies for small tumors, but as surgical skill has increased, almost anybody is eligible for partial nephrectomy, it seems, particularly with a very skilled surgeon. Uh, we talk about patients who have either limited residual renal function, and of course the surgeons will be much more aggressive in a patient like that, as opposed to a patient who has two working kidneys and doing a nephrectomy may not be harmful, particularly if the patient's a bit older. So in terms of imaging, it's detecting tumors, figuring out what the tumor is, but also showing exactly where the tumor is so we can plan on therapy. Now, AUA, the Urologic Association Guidelines for 
performing partial nephrectomy, you can see they're numerous. It should be a priority for CT1A lesions. Nephron sparing approaches should be a priority in patients who have anatomic or functionally solitary kidneys, bilateral kidneys, known familiar RCC or pre-existing kidney disease or proteinuria because you want to spare as much as possible in those patients and the risk reward is leaving kidney behind. And also particularly for patients, again, who are younger with multiple lesions or comorbidities. So an experienced urologist can really understand what needs to be done in what patient. And obviously, radiology works very closely with them. The um, AUA guidelines mention radical nephrectomy uh, in patients who can't get partial nephrectomy. It's preferred when there is a highly complex tumor and partial nephrectomy will be challenging. There's no pre-existing kidney disease. The contralateral kidney is normal. And the baseline estimate GFR will likely be greater than 45, even with a nephrectomy. So again, everything is a risk-reward at times, the easiest thing to do and the thing that gives you the best survival is a classic nephrectomy. The partial nephrectomy in the right patient will get almost the same results. Now, one of the other things, we talk about partial and the classic nephrectomy, but the third therapy that's very important is doing nothing. Active surveillance is an option for initial management in patients with masses that are suspicious but are smaller than 2cm. Active surveillance should be a priority when the anticipated risk of intervention or competing risk of death away the potential oncologic benefits of active treatment. So if the patient has a three-year survival for cardiac reasons or something else, there's no reason to get a partial nephrectomy because the tumor is going to grow slow enough. It's not going to affect the patient's lifespan. And in many of these smaller tumors, we've been able to follow them and show they really don't grow. So again, it's a strategy. And then if the tumor grows, at that point, remove it. So when you're the radiologist, there's certain uh, key imaging questions. Where's the tumor? What's the size of the tumor? Is there venous invasion? Is there arterial invasion? Is there adjacent organ invasion? Are there nodes present? Are there distant metastasis, be they liver, lung, or bone, for example? Now, in terms of protocols, our challenge, which in my mind, if you do the protocol well, it's going to be easy to answer all the questions, but what we're trying to do is optimize lesion detection, optimize lesion classification, and then optimize data presentation to referring physician. We want to do all of this while minimizing the dose to the patient, minimizing the complexity of the study, yet maximizing the information. Now, going back to the comment about most renal lesions being discovered serendipitously. That is indeed true. About two-thirds of lesions have been detected incidentally, but this article by Dyer way back when makes the point that we're better than ever detecting lesions, and we keep getting better, but our classification or characterization has definitely lagged. And you look at this because this is an older series, but even from newer series, about a quarter of patients who have tumors resected that were under 3CM, the lesions are actually benign. So it's very important to realize that not every mass is a malignancy. Yes, you can have a renal cell, but it could be an oncocytoma, could be an AML, or a complex renal cyst. The larger the tumor is, the more likely you're going to be dealing with malignancy. Of course, we know there are simple cysts that can be very large. The flip is a small renal cell carcinoma likely to be low grade and have indolent behavior. Therefore, when lesions are small, and small often is defined as under 1 cm, they should be observed. Now, many people will observe lesions 2 cm and sometimes even to 3 cm. The ACR guidelines for small renal lesions, those under a centimeter, is follow-up at 3 to 6 and then 12-month intervals. Okay, whether you use CT or MR, it's up to your expertise. But again, it's very easy to detect even minimal changes. So now let's get to doing a CT scan. There are many decisions. The contrast protocol, rate, volume, the scan parameters, slice thickness, the pitch, the phase of acquisition. If there wasn't a radiation dose issue, everybody would get four phases. Arterial venous, nephrographic, and excretory. But there is a radiation issue. 
and particularly when patients are younger. So what do we do? How many phases? Remember our rule is you don't want to do one phase too many or one phase too few. If you do the study poorly and you just minimize dose, you may minimize the ability to make the right diagnosis. So all of these things are a careful balance. And then as I'll speak to you, the role of 3D post-processing becomes very important. Now we talk about four phases I mentioned a moment ago. And the fact is there's no one perfect phase and every phase has certain advantages to it. So let's look at some of the phases. Now, non-contrast CT, I'll typically say, okay, rule out stone disease, that's non-contrast CT. That's all you need to do. But it's more than that in terms of where a non-contrast scan fills in and gives us lots and lots of information. And if you don't have non-contrast, that's one of the reasons patients will end up with a partial nephrectomy for a benign lesion. So when you talk about renal cystic lesions and non-contrast CT, I think it's important to recognize what can you see in a non-contrast scan. Well, if you have a homogeneous renal mass that measures over 70 Hounsfield units on a non-contrast scan, it's a greater than 99.9%. .9%. This is a high-density renal cyst and not a renal cell carcinoma. So over 70. And here's a good example. You see a lesion in the left kidney. It's about 67 Hounsfield units. There it is, arterial phase. Now remember, if you only had arterial phase, you would, mem would measure it at 68 and say, aha, clear cell renal cells of carcinoma versus papillary. And at 68, I would have gone with papillary. But because you have the other scan, because it doesn't change from arterial to non-contrast, and it really doesn't change to delayed phase, this is a high-density renal cyst. There's no difficulty in making the diagnosis. Now, on the non-contrast scan, you could have said a high-density renal cyst. On the arterial phase, you couldn't. And if you only had delayed phase, you couldn't. So one of the reasons we get non-contrast is to give us a baseline, which helps us in these difficult cases. Now, what if you don't have a non-contrast? Maybe the whole renal mass was an incidental finding on a pancreatic dual-phase study. Well, the good thing to remember is, even if you have a relatively hypovascular papillary RCC, it will change attenuation between the arterial and venous, and often it'll change by 20 Hounsfield units. If a lesion stays exactly the same from arterial to venous, it's likely going to be a high-density renal cyst, so you better think about it that way. If something goes from 70 non-contrast to 70 arterial to 70 venous to 70 delayed, it's a high-density renal cyst. There's nothing to think about. The issue is if you only have the positive contrast arterial and venous, but again, one of the great things to remember is that, that if it doesn't change, it's likely going to be a high-density renal cyst. Here's a well-defined lesion, 86 Hounsfield units, high-density renal cyst. But what if you would have scanned this patient without contrast? This was just a routine pancreas, perhaps, let's say. Well, then you would see a mass as 94 Hounsfield units, and you would say incidental renal cell carcinoma. So I want you to remember, when you only have the one phase, you could make a terrible error, and that's why patients still go for partial nephrectomies. Well, because at 94, you don't know what happens. It touches down a little bit on excretory phase, but very minimal, and if you go from non-contrast to arterial to delayed, it really doesn't change much. That's a high-density renal cyst. Another example, there's a lesion in the left kidney. It's high-density and well-defined. There it is on the coronal with some narrow windows, which help. Now you see it on the excretory phase. Honestly, if I saw that on excretory, I would say this is a renal cell carcinoma, maybe papillary, maybe clear cell, but it's a tumor, but it didn't change numbers. And that's where the number is so important and why multiple phases are so important. This article by Akana makes the point, masses containing fat or with attenuation less than 20 or greater than 70 should be considered benign as long as they don't have thickened walls or septations. Now, the reason is under 20 is a simple cyst over 70, it's a high density renal cyst. Things in the middle, 20 to 70, would be considered indeterminate and concern for tumor. So the 20 to 70 becomes what would be called the, uh, in Pooler's mind, the danger zone. And in their paper, the average attenuation non-contrast for renal cell carcinomas was 39.7. So you can see under 20 benign, over 70 benign non-contrast, around 40 is where you're gonna find the tumors. Very, very important. Now, 
Um, it's important to recognize that these rules are not perfect. Again, look at the shape of the lesion. Make sure it's well-defined. Make sure there's no irregular or thickened septations. But again, this 20 to 70 works out extremely nicely. And we did a chart here. You see 20 to 70 is indeterminate. Above 70, high density. Under 20, simple cysts with fat, AML. And you can see we put in the red mark at 37 or so. That's where the renal cell carcinomas on non-contrast will tend to sit. And it's auto by Corwin. An incidental renal mass is considered to be a benign cyst if it's both homogeneous and less than 20 Hounsfield unit in, in attenuation and considered indeterminate if it measures above 20 on either non-contrast or contrast-enhanced scans. So one of the things that Corwin did mention is occasionally they found some tumors that were less than 20 on non-contrast. That's exceedingly rare, but all of those with contrast behaved as you would expect them to. Now, one of the other challenges with small renal lesions is angiomyolipomas. Now, if you have a classic angiomyolipoma that's all fat, that's the easiest thing in the world, or a lot of fat, that's the easiest thing in the world. But AMLs often are fat poor, or they have little drops of fat. In tuberous sclerosis patients, you often see multiple lesions of variable fat content, but it's important to remember on patients who have, who have sporadic renal angiomyolipomas, which are most common middle-aged women, you always have to worry about that possibility. The issue about angiomyolipomas, when they get larger, they can rupture and they can bleed. The bleeding is related to how much vascularity that's present. Now, as I mentioned, sometimes it's simple, mass left kidney, extending outside the kidney. It's all fat density on non-contrast. You can see some of it enhancing on the arterial phase. Or this right renal mass, all fat, all 5.6 centimeters of it, angiomyolipoma. Here's a patient with an angiomyolipoma with septations, but again, it's all fat. And here it is on the cinematic. And angiomyolipomas can infiltrate the entire kidney. Here's one looking almost like a liposarcoma. So you recognize that's the entire kidney, upper two-thirds. Just a beautiful example of an angiomyolipoma. Now, in patient with tuberous sclerosis, you see multiple bilateral angiomyolipomas, often in enlarged kidneys. The key thing to recognize here, it shows you very nicely how different lesions indeed look differently. With tuberous sclerosis, besides having AMLs, the kidneys are often enlarged with too numerous to count angiomyolipomas. And there it is on the cinematic. So really a good look at the spectrum of AMLs. Now, fat-rich AMLs is defined as a lesion measuring under 10 Hounsfield units on non-contrast scans. And the majority of AMLs are going to be like this, but not everything. There's about 5% of AMLs have a small amount of fat corresponding to a fat-poor AML, and even a small percent will have basically no fat at all. And that's why when you look, sometimes when the surgeons do a partial nephrectomy, the report comes back, fat-poor AML. So it can be a challenge. Now, part of it is being careful. You look at the left kidney, non-contrast, at first glance, you don't see much. With contrast, and this is the laid phase, you see a four centimeter mass, but there's a little dot in there. If you just assume that dot here and there is just fluid, you'd be wrong. If you measured it, it measured fat attenuation. There are a few other droplets of minus 20 to minus 30 within the mass. That's a angiomyolipoma, what might be better described as a fat-poor angiomyolipoma. Here's another one, right kidney. Little dot in the center of that lesion, which comes out to be fat. Now, remember the ACR says under 1 cm, just follow. So this lesion would not have been something you took out. It would be something you followed. But here I don't even need to follow it because I know it's an AML. And again, putting a cursor there and not just giving visual inspection becomes very critical because from visual inspection, it looks like a cyst with a little dot, not the fat which gives you that AML. Now, I mentioned about... When you look at non-contrast, the lesions need to be well-defined, at best some thin septations. When you look at the lesion in the left kidney, there's calcification, there's high density. That's not something you're thinking could be a cyst. This is surely going to be a tumor, and sure enough, when you give IV contrast, 
The lesion is not very vascular, but it enhances, and that was a papillary renal cell carcinoma. Here it is on a few more images, but from the non-contrast, you should never make the mistake of calling that a simple cyst because it's solid density, it's not cystic, it doesn't have sharp margins, it just looks like a worrisome lesion, and it was a cancer. Now, one of the things we do next when I lecture is typically talk about the kidney as functional imaging because depending when you image the kidney, what the kidney looks like and what information it'll give you is going to be different. Now, we spoke about non-contrast and how much great information we get, but let's look into the various phases. But before we do that, why don't we take a coffee break? Let's do a coffee break and we'll come back in five minutes. See you then. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.